We love movies, anytime. But without a doubt, we firmly believe that Christmas is the best time for movies any time of year. We remember the years from our childhoods, anticipating, you know, before the VCR, uh, when the movie was going to be on. Uh, and since then, watching them with our children and our grandchildren together uh, as special moments together. We have a list, of course. Uh, everything from the uh, It's a Wonderful Life to White Christmas to Elf to The Grinch to Christmas with the Cranks, uh, a newer edition, uh, and beyond. Each December, they are almost must-sees for us to feel like Christmas is coming. They're all great stories. And while, of course, they aren't the story, many of the reasons that they are favorites, and not just for us, is because of the way they echo the Christmas story. Because in the midst of all of those modern stories, we have the original stories, the ones that, in a real way, gave birth to all the others. And as we watch any one of them, we can't help but start to think a lot about some of those other Christmas shows. The main characters so often go through a sort of transformation. You know, we know. George Bailey finds hope again. The Grinch's heart grows three sizes. The list goes on. Bing, Rosemary, Danny, and Vera create a community for a general who thinks his life has passed him by in White Christmas. Luther reclaims his focus in giving his dream vacation to his elderly neighbors at Christmas in Christmas with the Cranks. Or Eddie showing up. Eddie showing up at Clark's house in an RV and testing the family's generosity. And when you think about it, as much as these are Christmas stories, they also could be considered Advent stories. Because Advent is all about getting ready. Advent is all about our own transformation. It's about preparing our hearts for someone who is coming and about opening it up in a new way of being. And if we dig a little deeper, we acknowledge that there is a longing deep inside of each of us, which this season has the ability to rekindle. And our guess is that longing is somehow connected in our hearts to something God has already placed there love. So what do you long for? How does that make you feel? This is the second week of Advent, and we call this week's candle the candle of love. Last week we were reminded that Advent is about waiting in hope, and this week we combine that waiting with love, and we get this thing called longing. Advent is about longing for something. Our text today is from Joel, chapter 2. Now, Joel is a prophet. Yes, we, we know, we know, another prophet. But this, this one is with a wholly different message and scenario. Joel is not delivering your usual prophetic warning. Destruction is about to befall all you, you for all the ways you and your country, Israel, have turned from God. No, Joel is talking to people who are not being blamed or being held responsible for a current tragedy. And it is a truly natural disaster. For them, it was locusts, plagues and plagues of locusts, which brought total destruction on the land. The stories of the Israelite nation, as we hear through scripture, describe the struggles they had with God, and they go through their ups and downs. Last week, we preached from the book of Daniel and recalled a nation taken into captivity in exile for 70 years by the Babylonian Empire. The Persian Empire eventually conquered the Babylonians and allowed the Jewish people to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Their long exile was over. Ta-da! God had fixed it. Everything was going to be normal, right? It's all going to be fine. That's what had been promised. Everything is back to normal, but just like we are struggling with things not being normal and desperately wanting them to be, the Israelites were struggling as well. 
The prophet Joel called the people to come and worship in the midst of all the devastations of the year back in the promised land. And remember, worship involved bringing offerings of the land to the temple. But scripture tells us there was nothing to offer. The land was ruined, the crops and animals were gone, um, leaving the Israelites empty-handed. They couldn't worship the way they were used to. But still all of them, even the people usually left out, were to bring what they had, their hearts, their minds, their strength, all broken open. God would take care of the rest, though maybe not quite in the way they had expected. And that is when Joel says, yet even now, even now when you're worried and anxious, even now when it feels like you have nothing to offer, even now as you try to figure out how to manage everything going on, even now with this situation and these rules and restrictions and under these circumstances, even now when it feels impossible, yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart. And then, though it feels like our hearts can't take anymore, God invites us to be vulnerable one more time. But this time, it's just that it's an opening, a chance for all that has that's in us to be revealed and for all that God offers us to be received. In that open space, God will leave a blessing, even if we aren't sure what that means just yet. But isn't that what Advent is about? An opening, a making space, a preparation for God to come into the world and do a new thing, an impossible new thing, the divine becoming human, taking on flesh and living among us even now. This year, when so much we are used to feels impossible, God is still calling us to open up and make space, to turn to God with all our heart and to find that there is a blessing we never expected poured out. Into all those open hearts, God was pouring out the Spirit, not just on church people or not just on leaders or adults, not just on those who were ready or worthy, on all flesh. God coming to earth wasn't just for some, but for all. We might hear the word from strangers or outsiders. We might hear it coming from our own mouths. We might hear God speaking through different people in a different accent or a completely different way of communicating. Joel calls us to be ready to open our hearts to receive the truth that God is in our midst, even if God comes in a peasant baby born to an unwed teenager in a borrowed stable. Perhaps we might listen for the Spirit speaking through those we are imagining a way of worship that meets the challenges of a new day and a new generation. In Joel's time, they were forced to change because they physically could not do what they used to do how familiar that sounds and feels to us today. Will the visions and prophecies poured out on young and old show us a path toward encountering God anew? Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Yet even now, says the Lord, you shall know that I am in your midst. Yet even now, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. You see, Joel is not really a prophet like Isaiah or Jeremiah who were warning that people needed to change their behavior, but was all about reaching out and reaching forth to God. Here is an incredible truth to always keep in mind about the heart of God. Advent is about being ready as we prepare to encounter the God who comes to us. Now, naturally, the picture of God you have determines how and how why you prepare yourself for that encounter, and it does so significantly. If your idea of God is full of wrath and wants, God wants to harm you, then you'll want to get your act in order to avoid getting punished. But if God is loving and merciful, you prepare for the coming of the King by presenting your best, looking forward to his arrival out of expectation and gratitude. Here is the truth. The God who created us is not waiting for people to mess up so God can zap them. Our best understanding of God is a loving parent whose heart breaks when God's children turn away and hurt each other. So this morning, God cries out, return to me. God cries out, return to me, Israelites, thousands of years ago and right now to you. God says, return to me. And in returning, God calls us to do something. So what does that mean? 
Well, as you examine that picture, what if it looked like this? God loves you. God loves, God's wrapping, wrapping loving arms around you. There's nothing that can separate us from God's love. And yet if we turn away from God, we do not experience God's love. Now this happens all the time. Some people turn away out of shame, thinking, God can't love me. Some turn away out of pride and defiance, thinking, I don't need God. God's directive says, bring the main thing, your heart, back to me. I don't want your shame or your professions to do things better on your own or your external profession of how you want to make things right. Not your appearances, not your garments, your hearts. We are each composed of parts, layers, layers that we know God wants to reconcile completely. As Christians, we are supposed to transform the world for good. But that's a tall order. It's hard to change the world. We can do our best, we can work for good, we can pray for peace, but in the end, we find out an important truth. You can't create love in the world until you find love in yourself. And love changes us. Even the Christmas movies know this. George C. Scott as Scrooge realizes the errors of his ways and his heart is transformed. And only then does he give generously. And in National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, in the end, we find Clark Griswold, who just wanted a perfect Christmas, and instead finds love of his family, despite the fact that everything goes wrong. Obviously, it doesn't have to be a movie. It's about the real life softening of your heart and mind to remember a longing, a hope, a willingness to believe, a willingness to believe that things can be different. If we're really serious about Advent, if we're really serious about preparing our hearts for the coming of Christ, if we're truly using this season to focus on what's coming, then there's no way that we won't be changed by it. Oh, maybe we won't have a big miraculous carol-filled Christmas morning, or maybe we will. But either way, inside our heart, if you listen closely, you'll hear the change happening and the love we are longing for filling us. And as powerful as that love is inside of us, it's even more powerful when we share it. What if in the face of all that we find troubling in the world, we showed the world what God's love really means? What if we showed how powerful it could be and is? When the Grinch saw the love that the Who's had, when he realized that this love was inside of them and couldn't be taken away, that's when he realized what it was all about. And that's when he was changed too. You and I, we're not who's in Whoville. We're disciples of Jesus Christ. The world calls us Christians. And we're the people who spend this time of year preparing our hearts for the one who is yet to come and being transformed in the process. And we have something we can share with the world. This time of year, no matter what's happening around us, we're called to prepare our hearts to love anyway. We're asked to open them up and to get ready to welcome Christ into the world. But more than that, we're called to love that world. The Israelites are choosing and responding to Joel's call to magnify God's love for the world through their actions, and their story is one that can inspire us. That's because Christ still comes into this world. Christmas still happens. It didn't happen just once. It happens all the time. Because Christmas may be about the story that we read and think we know and understand. It is, of course, about Mary and Joseph and the baby and the manger and no room at the inn. But that's not the end of the story. That's just the tip of it. The great Christmas story continues to play out. And the truly incredible thing is that you and I are invited onto the stage. And we even get to choose our own lines. In your encounter with God, you continue to change to be shaped, transformed as your inner selves change to show what does your outer self changes just as your inner self did to reflect this godly love to the world in what you do. This may be an advent in a Christmas like no other, but in the most important way, it's the same as ever. In the disruption, in the darkness, in the wondering, and the waiting, Emmanuel, God, is with us. Those characters, 
whoever you love in the movies. Wallace and Davis, Scrooge, George Bailey, and all the rest, those are great stories. But so is yours. And this Christmas, if you really open your hearts to the love of Christ this year, then your story is about to get really good. We can't wait to hear it. And neither can a world that could use some really good stories right now. And to God be the glory. Amen. Amen.